Taylor should business. This is the sickest. This is the sickest. What the allegations are. And, and what we're hearing in reports, in testimony, in alleged confessions, etc. This is the sickest in this scenario that I've ever seen. Where it's two people who at some point are consensually together and then what happens? It's bizarre and it, it could be a result if in fact the prosecution proves this could be a result of, of drugs, could be a result of, of mental illness, or just could be a result of pure evil. That's what the case will be about. So tonight we're going to take an in-depth look at this case from many different angles. Um, you know, the evidence, the psychosexual aspect of all of this, and then try to figure out who this defendant is. I, what, what was going on in her life? that could potentially lead her to where she is now. Let's begin by taking a look at this house of horrors. Around 3.25 a.m. on February 23rd, police responded to a call from a woman saying she had found her son's severed head in a bucket in the basement of her Green Bay, Wisconsin home. Officers were dispatched to the home where they discovered the gruesome scene a severed head in a bucket with a disembodied male organ and knives, blood on a nearby mattress, and other body parts, including a torso in bags. The last person to see the victim was 24-year-old Taylor Shabiznes. The criminal complaint states Shabiznes told police she and the victim were smoking methamphetamine, having sex involving strangulation and chains when she, quote, went crazy and choked him to death. Shabiznes told police she then performed sex acts on the body before dismembering it. The complaint says Shabiznes told police they were going to have fun trying to find all the organs. Taylor Shabiznes is now charged with first-degree intentional homicide, mutilating a corpse, and third-degree sexual assault. She faces life in prison if convicted. I told you, the sickest. What is alleged in this case? Beyond bizarre, there's something else going on here. We're going to try to figure it out tonight. Um, but she was in court today. And a lot of issues came up. And through that, you had testimony. We learned a little bit more about Taylor business and what happened here and what she allegedly said. Let's take a listen. During your interview of her on February 23rd of 2022, um, she made some comments that were odd, weird, unusual, correct? Things like that in the past she had feelings that she loved something so much that she killed it. Yes. Did she go on to tell you that uh, she and the um, deceased were, were smoking the bitch? Yes. And the bitch means ice, correct? Well, I asked her what that meant, what the bitch meant, and she um, referred then to it as ice. And ice, did you take that to mean uh, street slang for methamphetamine? Yes. From your uh, point of view, did it appear that drug use had been going on in that basement? There was a meth pipe. Um, it, had been, it appeared to have been used um, by the smoke char. Um, there was a gem baggie next to it that had what I recognized from my experience as probably methamphetamine. I later field tested for methamphetamine. Um, so there was evidence that that was there, yes. Did you come to find out that chains were maybe used, dog collars, things of that sort? Yes, she did indicate that. Did she indicate that one was put on her neck? At uh, one point, I believe she said that she had had one placed on her neck and there was one placed on Chad's. On that day, did you have uh, cause to draft a search warrant of a van? Yes. And uh, what information uh, did you have at that point when you were asked to draft that search warrant? Um, I had been told that Ms. Shabiznes had taken, driven that van from the victim's residence to where she was currently staying. Um, and that uh, there may have been body parts in the van. I did ask her if she had um, 
A, he was under any medications, and B, he actually ever been diagnosed with any mental health disorders, and she indicated no, but she was unsure. All right, let's bring in our guests tonight because we need some help in all this. Joining us tonight in Los Angeles, California, senior reporter for DailyMail.com, Caitlin Becker with us. Also joining us in Jacksonville, Alabama, forensic death investigator, professor of forensics at Jacksonville State University and host of the very popular Body Bags podcast, Joseph Scott Morgan. And in New York City, nationally known psychotherapist, host of Talking Live and the Bite Size podcast, Dr. Robbie Ludwig is with us. Great to see everyone tonight. Um, Caitlin Becker, I am not overselling this, am I? This, this was some, the facts as you learned about the scene and everything else. Um, you guys cover everything at the Daily Mail. This is, this is way up there on the like, wow, beyond sick. There is no way to oversell how disturbing this case and this crime is. I mean, when we sit here and cover these cases and when I come on the show and I talk to you about them, we're usually talking about murder, about a loss of life, which in and of itself is just a disregard for humanity. But the facts of this case are so egregious and disturbing, not only how the crime is committed, what happened in the hours after the crime, the her allegedly saying that she toyed with the body sexually for two or three hours before making the decision to decapitate him with household items, dismember him, and then hide the body parts in various boxes and places, almost like a messed up scavenger hunt. I have never in the course of my career seen anything like this. Joseph Scott Morgan, um, your line of work, forensic death investigator for years, right? Um, wrote a book about a blood beneath my feet. Where Have you come across things like this in your career? Where would you place what we are learning about Taylor business and, and, and what happened in the basement of that home? I've only had, over the course of my career in New Orleans and Atlanta, uh, only had a couple of dismemberments. It, and I, I will say, um, doing you know hosting body bags in particular, um, I have seen an uptick in the number of dismemberments, and I find that kind of kind of interesting. It seems as though that there is a callus that has been formed uh, to this because you have to get to the point in 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 your mind where not only are you killing someone, but you're comfortable enough uh, to the point where you can take, as you mentioned, household items. We're not talking about surgical instruments here and literally taking a body apart in order to dispose of it. There's a certain there's a certain comfort, maybe a numbness to it. I, I don't know, but it is it it is very shocking. And I think when a lot of the details come out from what these men and women observed at the scene, this is something that will live in their memories forever and ever as investigators. Dr. Robbie Ludwig, I want you to take a listen to Detective uh, Kemp from the Green Bay PD. Um, one of the detectives that's there interviewing Taylor Shabiznis after all of this. Let's take a listen. Did you um, form any impressions that Taylor Shabiznis was in a, a drugged state or in an intoxicated state on February 23rd of 2022 when you and Detective Groff were talking with her? I did not feel that. If that would have been something that I would have noticed or thought, I would have been more concerned about doing the interview with her and causing issues. I felt that she was aware of her surroundings, able to talk, able to understand everything, and I felt that the interview was fine to do. The the interview on February 23rd, you didn't find out about the trazodone use or the methamphetamine use until deep into the interview. Is that fair? Yes, it was later into the interview that she'd indicated about the trazodone and the meth. All right, Dr. Robbie, we're going to get into the psychosexual aspect of all of this in our next segment. But here, I want to focus with you on drugs and the impact that meth and drugs can have on people's behavior and what they do and what they say. 
versus someone who could be mentally ill or someone with a combination of the two yeah. versus trying to figure out if someone is just evil. Yeah, and, and we don't have enough information yet. I mean, certainly her behavior is extraordinarily evil, and she seems to take responsibility for her behavior. What we do know about methamphetamines is that when someone is high on this kind of drug, they can become psychotic and very violent. Uh, and sometimes they act on these bizarre fantasies they might be having and go into almost like a schizophrenic state. Uh, we don't know whether that was the case with her, but we certainly know that there are reports of very violent crimes where people have been on this kind of, of upper methamphetamines. Here's another one of the detectives, Detective Graf, uh, talking about, again, what Taylor Shabiznis uh, told police. Did um, Ms. Shabiznis indicate that... Uh, her and the decedent had smoked some methamphetamine um, at the apartment on Eastman Avenue. Um, yes. Before February 23rd of 2022? Yes. And did she indicate that, that Taylor Shabizas took some trazodone pills that belonged to Mr. Tomes? Correct. Did she indicate that Taylor Shabizas crushed up the trazodone pills and used a hypodermic needle to inject herself and the deceased. That's what she told me, yes. All right, Caitlin, what do we know about the relationship here and what do we know about Shad and Shad and, and Taylor? Well, it seems their relationship was essentially kind of like a friends with benefits situation. We know that they were friends. We know that they were involved in a sexual relationship. It seemed like they grew up in the same area, probably went to the same schools. But outside of that, I don't know how deep it went. I'm not sure, based on what I've learned, if Taylor Shabiznis can have a deep relationship maybe with any anyone in her life, um, which is something that could be, if, obviously we may get into that Let's get into that later a little bit. As you can see by the video that's playing here, she attacked her attorney at a previous hearing. She does seem very, very unhinged. Um, Chad, by all accounts from his family and friends, seemed like a kind of sweet, nice, normal guy with friends. He worked for his parents, was pretty much an average kid. They were the same age. They were, you know, 24 years old at the time, kind of just starting out their life. Neither one of them seemed like they were on an incredibly great path at the time, but nothing really in his life to indicate that he would become a victim of some kind of heinous crime like this. Okay, guests are staying with us. When we come back, we're going to talk about the psychosexual nature of what the allegations are and what happened in that basement. Plus, coming up next hour. In Park City, Utah, the case everyone is talking about, mother of three, Corey Richens, accused of killing her husband, Eric, then trying to profit from it by writing a children's book about grief. Is she a sociopathic killer or a wrongfully accused widow? Did that phone uh, ever, uh, was, or was a, a query placed in that phone, quote, can cops, period, uncovered, deleted, period, messages, iPhone, close quote? Yes. Michigan daughter now facing charges. Megan Amirowitz is accused of throwing lye and water on her own father while he was sleeping. The chemical reaction caused severe burns and ultimately his death. Police caught up with the daughter and she was arrested soon after. The teen faces life in prison if convicted. And Court TV will bring you inside the courtroom for every moment. The Sleeping Father Death Trial. Live coverage weekday mornings only on Court TV. In this particular case, we have the alleged victim's appendage, the penis found separate from the body, which is very unusual. Um, I would argue that, you know, uh, it's hard to connect a, a third degree sexual assault with uh, an appendage that is separated from the body. So 
The defense to the sexual assault or of the victim is that his organ was not connected to his body, so you can't commit the sexual assault. That, that's going to be the legal defense. I get it. I, I, I get He's got to make arguments. He's got to say something, right? But let's kind of dive a little bit deeper into what happened here and, and what it means and how someone, where does this come from? Where does this come from in a human to, to want to do this? Take a listen. This is more from a, the defense motion that they lost today, by the way. But in that motion, they're describing some of the things that are alleged to have happened. That she business, uh, uh, the, the conduct and what she did uh, after, the, after the killing. Take a listen. Christopher T. Froelich, on behalf of the defendant Taylor Shabiznis, moves the court to formally dismiss the charge in count three, third degree sexual assault, due to lack of evidence. Third degree sexual assault, as defined, is committed by someone who has sexual intercourse with another person without consent. Sexual intercourse is defined by any intrusion, however slight, by any part of a person's body or of any object into the genital or anal opening of another. The state alleges that a sex toy was placed into the anus of the alleged victim, yet the state lab report yields an inconclusive result for DNA evidence. Any claims that the defendant placed a sex toy into the anal opening of the deceased is without merit based on the state of Wisconsin lab of hygiene reports. The defense also argues the victim was not a person at the time of the alleged incident as he was deceased. The defense asserts that once the person is deceased, they are no longer a person as defined under the jury instructions and statute. The defense argues that the victim's penis was detached from his body and found on February 23, 2022, when law enforcement came to the home at Stony Brook Lane. There were apparently other alleged body parts found in a Jimmy Choo bag, in an Under Armour bag, and in a Crock-Pot box found in the Chrysler minivan. The defense argues that it would be unlikely and almost impossible for any sexual assault to occur with how dismembered the body was when found. The penis was not attached to the body and was therefore unable to function due to its condition. Now let's bring back in our guest, Caitlin Becker, senior reporter, DailyMail.com, Joseph Scott Morgan, Body Bags Podcast, and Dr. Robbie Ludwig, um, Bite Size Podcast. Dr. Robbie, where does this come from? You know, if in fact she's, she's done what she allegedly admitted to police that she did, this sexual assault of someone who she has just killed... Well, we don't know what the meth had to do with it, unleashing kind of a psychotic, violent fantasy that she acted on. If she's um, a necrophiliac, that's someone who is attracted to and wants to make love to a dead body. So clearly she falls into that category. And we don't really know much about why people uh, are engaging in necrophilia because it's usually done in secret and it's not that common. I think it affects less than 1% of, of the people out there. Uh, so we are seeing like a combination of factors that are unhealthy. I My first thought was, is she a victim of incest or some kind of sexual violence herself and that there's a vengeful component towards that she showed towards this friend former friend of hers uh and it just kind of took on a life of, of its own let's take a listen to detective kemp here talking about what again what taylor business says she and shad were engaging in i guess this is prior to him dying as part of your investigation did you come to find out that Chains were maybe used, dog collars, things of that sort. Yes, she did indicate that. Did she indicate that one was put on her neck? Uh, at one point, I believe she said that she had had one placed on her neck and there was one placed on Chad's. Um, did you see any, like, marks or bruising or anything like that on Taylor Shabizz's neck on February 23rd of 2022? I did not. I believe she indicated that the one on her neck wasn't pulled or used. She wasn't choked? I believe she said that she was not choked. 
All right, Joseph Scott Morgan, uh, we understand that he was strangled to death. It, it may very well have been during these moments when he's got maybe a dog collar and some chains on. What type of force is it going to take to take someone's life under those types of circumstances? Not, not, too, not too much, particularly if he's got trazodone on board, which is a suppressant. You know, it kind of presses down uh, the system. Uh, it's used as it's used to uh, as kind of a sedative. But it, here's another part that uh, another report that I'd read. Uh, Vin, uh, she was engaged. Apparently, one report came out that she had been engaged in something called burking. Not many people are familiar with this, and this is where you have an individual that will seat themselves upon the back or the chest of an individual. Uh, that is compromised in some way already. Now, you can still choke somebody out by this, but if you compromise their ability to allow their chest to rise and fall, you know, to kind of expand, to uptake oxygen, and he reportedly had blood coming out of his mouth at that point in time. So uh, maybe she started out with burking. Sometimes that can be used as um, uh, part of a sexual paraphilia, if you will, where they engage in this kind of very painful sex play uh, she may have finished him off by strangulation manually or with ligature. Certainly chains are involved. They came, they came apparently prepared. This is not something that's new to them. This is not new territory they're exploring. This is something that they were loaded up for at this particular time. The outlier here is going to be the drug involvement, I think. Uh, Caitlin Becker, do we have any other information about the collars and some of the details of, of what they were engaged in and what they were allegedly using? It seems like the chains that they were using were akin to what you would use as like a choke collar for a dog. So something that I would imagine would be somewhat like thinner that you would see around a dog that you could pull in one direction or another. And like Joseph said, they had all of these implements there and at the ready. It does sound like something that they had played with before and they were sort of into um, within their sexual relationship. So it does seem like something that the victim was already comfortable with. So it doesn't seem as though the alleged killer forced the collar on him or forced the chain on him or even forced the act of choking on him. It was when it went too far that he ended up ending his life. And I'm sure we could dive into the sort of sexual side of this in a different way. But I just you know, want to point out that there's no indication that being um, interested in or having proclivities towards BDSM or um, choking or collars or any of these implements are any sort of precursor to violent behavior. So I definitely want to sort of make that distinction that there are plenty of people out there that do these things. And as part of a healthy sex life, if that's what you're into, good for you. If it's not good for you, how this ended is not how this began. And I do wonder if Joseph's right, if the drug aspect of that is what perhaps changed this, or if like she said, like you said earlier, Vin, she's just evil.